Hello everyone and many thanks for joining us today for our strategic update and 2024 annual press conference. Thanks very much for your time and your interest in Bayer. As you know, we will host our Capital Markets Day with investors and analysts later today here in London. But before this afternoon session, we wanted to give you the opportunity to hear an update on the company's strategic priorities and outlook, as well as business results for 2023 and guidance for 2024. All members of Bayer's Board of Management are here in the room and you will hear from each of them before we open the floor for your questions and their answers. Okay, let's get started. But before we begin, I would like to draw your attention to the forward looking statement disclaimer and other legal information provided on this chart. And with that, I'd like now to hand it over to the CEO of Bayer, Bill Anderson. Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. As Michael just said, we have the whole board here, including our two newest members. Heike has been with us since last summer, so she may already be familiar to some. Uh, and Julio is so new to the team that he's not even officially on board yet. He was named the next president of our consumer health division. Julio has been in healthcare for 30 years and he pairs strong commercial, financial, and analytic skill sets. Uh, he joins us from the pharma division, and he's also spent considerable time in consumer health. Heiko is still fully on board until the end of April, and he'll be representing his business today. But I'd also like to give you the chance to get to know Julio. So why don't you say a few words? Yeah. Thanks, Bill, and uh, hello to all of you. It is a real pressure for me to be here today. Uh, I'm looking forward to officially joining the board and the consumer health team. Uh, the consumer health market is an incredibly attractive and dynamic uh, market. Our business is home to great brands and tremendous science. Heiko and the team have done a fantastic job with the business, and I can't wait to get started to get to know you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Well, thanks, Julio. Uh, and to all of you, we really appreciate you taking an interest in Bayer. Uh, we're very happy to have the opportunity to share our plans for the company with all of you today. Let me start by looking at where the company comes from. Over decades, Bayer has built businesses in crop science, pharmaceuticals, and consumer health. That's happened through organic growth and a lot of M&A, including 12 major transactions in less than 20 years. That includes seven acquisitions and five separations. In that time, Bayer has almost completely changed its lines of business. From being one of the world's largest chemical companies, now down to three areas of focus. That's a remarkable feat. And my predecessors have shown remarkable strategic foresight and guts. But all that rearrangement has come at a very high cost both in terms of the debt that we now have on our balance sheet and in shifting the focus away from operations. And what is operations? That's really the core task of ensuring that each employee can add value for customers every day. Well, that's where we come from. Today, we're only 10 weeks into the year, but I'd like to share a snapshot of what's happened both inside and outside of the company in just the past 65 days. In pharma, we received market authorization for ILEA, eight MIGs, in the EU. Our experimental medicine for menopause symptoms, Elanzanatent, met all primary and secondary endpoints in two phase three studies. We announced that we have the plan and the support of our employee representatives to implement our new operating model. That's important because it's a massive change. To address our debt challenge, we proposed cutting the dividend to the legal minimum. That's a step that's unprecedented in Bayer's modern history. We received an adverse verdict in glyphosate litigation, we won another case, and we saw a mistrial in a third. Right now, we're introducing short stature corn to farmers in the US. Yesterday, we strengthened our pharma pipeline with a new cardiology drug for Europe. And tomorrow, Aspirin celebrates its 125th birthday. We recently launched two new formulations behind the brand in both the US and Germany. Think about that, a 12 decade heritage and we're still innovating behind it. Meanwhile, over the course of these 10 weeks, our share price has hovered around a 20 year low. 
Well, I share this 65-day retrospective because it's indicative of what I found when I joined the company. A relevant mission, strong scientific and innovative capacity, a pharma business that's progressing very well on an important rebuild. We have leading positions in both crop science and consumer health, and a highly skilled and dedicated workforce. But we're facing some material challenges that remain unresolved, and they weigh on our company. And it's time for that to change. Capitalizing on our opportunities while resolving our challenges, that's what today is all about. We need to consider what's best for Bayer today to enable a better future for the company tomorrow. Let me illustrate this idea with a personal experience. In 2021, I had a number of important plans and goals, both professional and personal. But on a Sunday morning in June that year, I was skateboarding, something I'd been doing regularly for more than 40 years. And I had a freak fall and I broke my right femur in four places. I was face down in the street, no friends or family with me, and my leg was bent almost 90 degrees. And I was on the edge of unconsciousness from the pain. At that moment, all my plans and goals were suspended. Facts took over. I needed a hospital, a surgeon, titanium parts to hold my bone together, days of nursing care, and months of intense physical therapy. Well, today I can come before you with the ability to do everything I could before my accident, uh, except for skateboarding due to a lack of authorization from my wife. My change in circumstances, it didn't stop my pursuit of the most important goals, but it did force me to alter my path. Before the accident, I was a man with a plan. After the accident, I was a man with a plan and a shattered femur. Having a broken leg didn't make me a lesser person, but it did dictate my immediate actions and it greatly limited my options in the moment. Due to the wonders of modern video conferencing, I barely missed a day of work, but the accident did pretty much change my ability to do everything else. There are some parallels between my personal story and Bayer today. Today, we're a company that makes a tremendous impact in the world every day for millions of farmers, patients, and consumers. Sustainability is an integral part of our operations, and our businesses make enormous contributions to food security, to health equity, and the health of the planet. We've shown that we can lead in industries. We've shown we can turn businesses around. We also have a decades-long track record of managing our portfolio, investing in businesses we want to grow, and separating from businesses that are best positioned elsewhere. If I stop the description of Bayer there, one could ask several strategic questions of the firm. What's the right structure for the company? Are these businesses all best positioned under one roof? Are there new business areas we should be pursuing that are adjacent to the existing ones or even further afield? But the description of Bayer doesn't stop there. We are a high impact, mission driven life science company with three strong businesses, but we're badly broken in four places. Shareholders who've been with us for the past five years have experienced the pain of this condition and our employees have been through multiple rounds of layoffs. And all of that has been highly unsatisfactory because the brokenness has not been fixed. The four broken areas are our pharma loss of exclusivities, litigation, our debt levels, and a hierarchical bureaucracy that blocks progress. These four challenges greatly limit our ability to choose our destiny whether that be as a three division company or in smaller parts. We seriously considered the structure of our company. We did this with the help of numerous external advisors and a set of assessment criteria that included valuation levels, value creation, speed of execution, execution certainty, timing of cash generation and the, the resulting leverage ratios and the impact on our future optionality. At first glance, there are really valid arguments to make a change. 
A pure play structure has become the norm in our industries. It's certainly the simplest approach, and I think we can all understand its appeal. But you always have to consider where you're coming from. And today, these four broken areas severely limit our access to structural options. Here's what I mean. When it comes to an IPO or a spin, this would require an all hands on deck effort for 18 to 24 months and cash contributions would be delayed beyond that time frame. In the meantime, the leverage ratios of Remain Co or New Co could go up significantly and that could jeopardize our access to reasonable financing. Then you could also look at a sale, which in our case is only relevant for consumer health. And you know, that could be attractive. I mean, we could pay down some debt with the one-time proceeds. Consumer health is a great business. It has a track record of delivering excellent results. But a separation would come with significant costs and tax leakage. We also have some pretty clear indications from comparables that valuations aren't so strong at the moment. And we would have to say goodbye to a business that's been generating steady cash every year. Further, neither of those options address the litigation ambiguity or the loss of exclusivities in pharma. I've seen companies try to get through patent cliffs by purchasing phase three assets. That's a very expensive game with a lot of risk. And frankly, the industry track record on these sorts of deals is poor. Finally, any kind of structural change would consume the bulk of management's time and energy over at least a 24 month period. Since joining Bayer, I've talked to a number of CEOs who've gone through big structural changes. What I heard from them is clear. You can overhaul operations to improve performance, or you can make a big structural change, but you can't do both at the same time. A big structural change could be a good reason for all hands on deck, but not today when we need total focus on overcoming these four challenges. In short, on the question of structure, our answer is not now. And this shouldn't be misunderstood as never. Of course, we'll keep an open mind. We always do that. But our priority is on tackling our challenges, boosting performance and creating strategic flexibility. We're convinced that this approach is what's best for Bayer. So for the next 24 to 36 months, that's where we'll put our energy and our focus, implementing our dynamic shared ownership operating model to improve performance, meaningfully address litigation, uh, advancing the debt level toward an A rating and building a strong pharma pipeline. The past 11 months weren't just marked by analysis. Over that time, we've taken bold action. In the summer of 2023, we initiated a decisive overhaul of Bayer's operating model that's already resulted in faster decision making, an acceleration of innovation timelines, and simpler structures. We've mobilized the entire company including our employee representatives, behind a reimagination of every aspect of our operations. In July of 2023, we made the tough call to cut our guidance. In August, a few weeks later, I said we had to deliver to begin learning, uh, earning back trust. In November, I said we were confident in our adjusted guidance. Today, as you saw from the results we published this morning, we delivered at the upper end of each aspect of our adjusted guidance. Now there are 12 more 90 day cycles between today and the end of 2026. At each one of those, our team, we intend to get up and say that we've delivered. Their supervisory board is also making major changes, including refreshing its membership with expertise in capital markets, mass litigation, and pharma product development. They're also proposing a new incentive compensation uh, system for us and the managers of Bayer. Short term, our management team will be compensated by three simple measures, revenue growth, profitability, and cash. That's the triangle that we're gonna be measured against. And we'll be measured not as individuals, but as a team. Long term, based closely on shareholder input, 
the supervisory board is proposing a compensation scheme that more closely aligns outcomes for management with outcomes for shareholders. There's a lot of change happening at Bayer. It's making us more accountable and transparent. That starts with taking a hard look at our four challenges. The first is the pharma loss of exclusivities and our pipeline. We see this as the biggest lever to recover value for the company. I like the progress here, but we have a lot more to do. The company has developed a strong early pipeline, and we have some very promising later stage candidates, but there's no doubt we're facing some difficult years with Zarelto and Ilea facing a loss of exclusivity. Our team has an unwavering focus on building the base business, accelerating our highest impact early stage projects, and maximizing the momentum we already have behind our launch assets. We delivered eight investigational new drug applications in 2023, and we're gonna keep moving at that pace. Our focus is on increasing the value of our assets over time, and we're leaning on our new operating model to boost our speed and efficiency in that work. Another major challenge is litigation. This is a huge burden on our financials and also on our ability to invest in better medicines and solutions to feed the world. Both PCBs and glyphosate are at the top of the boards and, and my agenda right now. They're very different cases with different dynamics and that shapes the nature and the pace of our response. But I can tell you we're making a number of changes in the way we manage them. Let me briefly start with PCBs. This is a product that Monsanto stopped selling in the 1970s. And there were multiple, uh, multiple parties involved in the production chain, so we're not alone. This is a different dynamic than glyphosate. The litigation on PCBs will ebb and flow over time, and that's gonna influence our response. We'll defend ourselves in individual cases as we also assess the broader situation. Switching to glyphosate, let me start with some facts. Glyphosate is safe. That's been confirmed time and time again by regulatory authorities and scientific bodies worldwide. Just three months ago, the European Commission extended the product's registration for another 10 years based on the European Food Safety Authority's thorough assessment. Even in California, a state where I've lived for many years, where even routine household items carry cancer warnings, a court said it would be false and misleading to put a cancer warning label on glyphosate products. Glyphosate is essential. It's the most widely used crop protection chemical in the world because of the unique role it plays in keeping weeds at bay and protecting the yields of important crops, from row crops to fruits and vegetables. This has major implications on keeping food prices affordable, which is especially important today after several years of high food inflation. Glyphosate facilitates no-till farming, which is pivotal for keeping carbon in the soil, which significantly reduces both energy and fertilizer requirements. Without glyphosate, carbon emissions from farming would rise dramatically. Glyphosate plays a major role in farm economics. Threats to its availability jeopardize the livelihood of farmers, as evidenced by the more than 360 farmer advocacy groups that recently brought this issue to the attention of the US Congress. They're concerned because Bayer is the only US source of glyphosate. Those are the facts. Now to actions. We have a number of cases upcoming this year our new general counsel has brought in some new external counsel, and we're adding a litigation expert to our supervisory board. We will defend ourselves vigorously. We welcome positive outcomes like the ones we saw on Friday, and we will continue to appeal every unfavorable verdict. By the way, we continue to see reductions of awards by roughly 90% on average. And we, we're still working to have these verdicts set aside completely. But it's clear that a strategy of defense alone is not enough. We're looking at the litigation topic from every angle, inside and outside the courtroom. 
That includes much more thorough engagement with other stakeholders in the realm of public policy. It includes considering every possible means to bring closure to these lawsuits for the company and for our customers. You should expect more action from Bayer in this space, but we'll only comment on it when and where it's in the company's best interests. Third, the debt. You can expect an intense focus on profitable growth from our base business, as well as conversion to higher cash flows. And we're not stopping there. Two weeks ago, we shared our plans to amend the dividend policy to reduce debt. We plan to pay out only the legal minimum over the next three years. That wasn't an easy step to take. In fact, it's the first time in post-war history Bayer has taken such a decision. We're determined to get back to strategic optionality, and we will continue to make the hard decisions that are right for the company. We're confident that our proposal will get approved by shareholders at the upcoming shareholders meeting. The reactions that I've heard and seen, they really confirm that this difficult step was a necessary one. Debt reduction will be our top priority with the retained cash. This step will help us advance toward a single A rating category over the next 36 months. Finally, bureaucracy. We're well underway in implementing a radical new operating model, dynamic shared ownership. This system redesigns the entire company into teams focused on improving lives for customers or improving our products, and it eliminates everything else. Let me be clear, this is not simply a cost savings program. Cost savings will be the outcome, not the goal. DSO will fuel growth through customer proximity and innovation. Consumer Health, our division with the shortest innovation cycles, has already shortened the timelines for some key launches. Crop Science is reimagining its commercial model to simplify the customer experience in all four regions. And Pharma is accelerating market access for ILEA 8 MIGs, one of our biggest launches this year. Work like that is what makes me confident because beyond the four challenges I just addressed, we have a lot to build on in our businesses. Dynamic shared ownership will focus the entire organization on customers and products. Resources will dynamically flow away from the old static processes and the committees and governance toward our highest impact projects. It will take out about 2 billion euros in annual organizational costs as of 2026, but costs are only one of the benefits. Now let me hand over to Heike for more on how we're bringing DSO to life. Thank you, Bill. By the end of this year, dynamic shared ownership will touch each and every part of our organization with dedicated teams organized around and focused on customers and products. These teams are supported by a network of enabling and technical functions, making decisions faster and in ways that best support customer needs in a more synergistic way than was possible in our previous hierarchical model. At the end of 2023, we already had 50 teams and two and a half thousand people working in this model. Today, we've scaled it up to 300 teams with thousands more working in the system. And we'll continue to scale with unprecedented speed and we expect to have nearly every employee at Bayer engaged in DSO by year end. To do this, we are working on a complete redesign of our operating model. We are reducing layers to the minimum imaginable. In some areas, we have 12 layers between Bill and our customers today. So here our target are five to six layers across the entire company. We're also reimagining span of enablement and coaching, something we used to call span of control, towards a minimum of more than 15 employees per leader. And we are optimizing our management structures. To put this into perspective, today we have more than 17,000 people managers. More than 30% of those managers lead small micro teams with, few or, with four or fewer direct reports. 
Some managers even only have one direct report. This not only creates complexity, but it also showcases the underlying challenges of a hierarchical model. So we are really flipping the script across our businesses. Let me give you one concrete example from our pharma team in North America. They went live at the end of last year with an entirely new operating model. They reduced the number of managers by around 40%, and they increased their span of coaching from eight to nine employees per leader to 15 to 20. They now operate with 68 field-based so-called micro-enterprises that are designed to provide a unified, much more seamless customer experience. These squads of around 15 to 20 people are largely autonomous, cross-functional units that set and they execute their own strategy. They have ownership of their spend and can flex resources or evolve team composition to address unique market dynamics and opportunities. This has already led to radical changes to unleash the power in our organization with a much flatter organization with more people being coached and guided by far fewer leaders. Across our enabling functions, we can also see substantial movements. We want to highlight two big steps we've taken to move towards a system that puts customers and not internal processes at the center. We dissolved complete organizations, such as our in-house business consulting team, and we are substantially reducing control organizations, such as our internal audit team, by close to 50% by reducing their scope to focus only on material risks. Across all our functions, we are putting everything on the table. We are not relying on how it's always been done, but really looking at what's really required what really adds value, and how we can best set ourselves up to deliver on customer needs. As a labor director, I would be remiss if I didn't point out how important our employee representatives are in this whole transformation. In a co-determination system like Germany, changes of the magnitude we are undertaking can sometimes take more time. Fortunately, our employee representatives understand the urgency of our situation and are very supportive partners in this transformation. They are helping us to move swiftly and at the pace we need to succeed. I'm in regular contact with them, and we are confident that DSO will propel Bayer to a better performance while creating more meaningful jobs at our company. With that, I'm handing over to Bill again. Thanks, Heike. Um, yeah, it's been great having you on board these last months, and uh, uh, we've got a yeah, we, we've got a really important work to do, and we're we're very fortunate to have someone of your uh, yeah your talents and, and knowledge on the case. So in a minute, Wolfgang is going to tell you how we see our business developing in 2024. Uh, but first, I'd like to paint a picture of where we're taking Bayer over the next three years. By the end of 2026, I see a company that has weathered the loss of exclusivities and rebuilt the pharma pipeline, that advanced effective strategies to contain litigation and has significantly improved our leverage ratios, that strengthened our leading position in agriculture, and that we're well on our way to bringing 10 blockbusters to market in crop science, that we're outperforming our peers with leading brands and consumer health, I see a Bayer that has tackled the bureaucracy, fully centered on customers and products, with each one of our businesses leaner and more effective than their competitors, with the strategic flexibility to claim its own destiny, and a system of performance that pushes us to be better in rapid intervals. The reason for all of that, uh, the reason it's so important, is because the work that we do, it really matters. When we say health for all, hunger for none, we're not being naive idealists. Hunger and disease aren't problems you can solve even in a lifetime. They're some of the biggest issues facing the world today. And we know our businesses can be a true force in addressing them. For crop science, that means taking today's level of agricultural production and then producing 50% more, all while restoring nature. For pharma, that means looking at diseases that have afflicted human life for as long as we can remember and daring to go after a new treatment, if not a cure. For consumer health, 
That means delivering medicines most of us take for granted for heart health, for cuts and bruises, or for a headache. But reaching a billion people with them, especially those who need health care the most. Those are big goals. They extend over decades, but they will give us clarity of what we're working toward. And I'm confident that we have the people, we have the products, and we have the plan to go after them. We're focused on doing that in the fastest, most productive way possible and getting rid of everything that stands in our way. Thank you very much. And I'd like to hand it over to Wolfgang. Thank you, Bill. Uh, first, I would like to briefly take you through our financial results for 2023. As you all know, we lowered our outlook in July last year, mostly due to much lower than expected glyphosate prices. We have delivered against our revised commitments based on a strong performance in the fourth quarter, in particular on the cash side. Sales came in at 47.6 billion euros and EBITDA before special items at 11.7 billion euros, both at the higher end of the range as we provided. Core earnings per share came in at 6 euros and uh, 39 cents at the upper end of the guidance corridor as well. With our revised outlook, we forecasted zero free cash flow for the year, but we actually achieved 1.3 billion euros by the end of the year. This also translated into a better than expected net financial debt, where we closed the year with 34.5 billion euros. There can be no doubt that we are far from the good results we had the year before. It must be kept in mind, however, that 2022 was an exceptionally good year for us in which we benefited from very high glyphosate prices. If we look at the past five years, we can see that our performance over that time frame was actually very robust. And we achieved this in a highly volatile macroeconomic environment, which was dominated by crises such as the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. Over the five-year period, we raised sales by around 2% per year and clean EBITDA by approximately 1% per year. But the clean EBITDA results do not fully translate into consistent free cash flow growth. Out of about 11.9 billion euros in EBITDA before special items, we only generated 2.3 billion euros in free cash flow on average per year. Of course, we need to account for capex, tax, financial results, and restructuring, but another major impact comes from litigation-related payouts. These latter include settlements and judgments and very significant cost of defense as well. Without these, our company would have generated about 5 billion euros of cash flow on average per year. I would now uh, like to briefly talk about the 2023 business performance in our three divisions, which my colleagues will then explain in more detail uh, later on. Please remember that we always refer to sales growth in currency and portfolio adjusted terms. This applies to what you will hear from me and also what you hear from my colleagues later on today. Let's start with the agricultural business. Sales at crop science fell by 4% to 23.3 billion euros. EBITDA before special items decreased by 27% to 5 billion euros. This development was mainly due to the significant price decline for glyphosate-based products. By contrast, the division achieved an above market sales growth of 7% in its core business, excluding glyphosate, thanks especially to price increases. Sales at pharmaceuticals in 2023 came in level year on year at 18.1 billion euros. We achieved significant gains with our most recently launched products, Nubeca and Carendia. Furthermore, we posted continued sales growth for ILEA and in our radiology business. These effects were more than offset by declining Xarelto sales and a much lower than anticipated sales in China. This letter was due partly to pandemic-related developments at the start of the year and an anti-corruption campaign in the health sector that indirectly impeded demand there. EBITDA before special items at pharmaceuticals decreased by 12% to 5.2 billion euros in 2023. This was primarily due to an unfavorable product mix and higher R&D investments. Sales at consumer health increased by an encouraging 6.3% to 6 billion euros, 
against an already strong previous year. We posted double-digit percentage sales growth in the dermatology category thanks, to part, thanks partially to continued high demand for betpantene and canistine, as well as in the pain and cardio category. We also significantly increased sales of cough and cold products, particularly in Europe. EBITDA before special items at consumer health increased by 3% to 1.4 billion euros in 23. So mainly driven by operational productivity programs, successful price management, and sustained sales growth. We thus more than offset the inflation-related strong rise in cost and higher investment in marketing innovative products. That concludes my review of our financial figures for full year 2023. Let me now move on to the outlook for 24, which is again adjusted for currency effects. For sales, we expect a relatively moderate development of minus 1 to plus 3% uh, growth in 2024, resulting in between 47 and 49 billion euros. The fairly broad range that we are forecasting here is due to the unpredictability of key business drivers. Regarding our top line, these are the expected double-digit decline of Xarelto sales due to the loss of exclusivity, the continued negative impact on our pharma business in China, and the volatility of the agricultural markets. Furthermore, we expect increased pressure on our profitability and thus an approximately 3 to 9% decline in EBITDA before special items. This results in 10.7 to 11.3 billion euros. We anticipate that core earnings per share will come in between 5 euros and 10 cents and 5 euros and 50 cents. Despite the lower profitability, we expect free cash flow to increase to between 2 and 3 billion euros. As a result, we aim to reduce our net financial debt to between 32.5 and 33.5 billion euros. As we already communicated two weeks ago, our clear focus for the next three years is to reduce our debt level. This is what we will mainly use our cash for. We therefore plan to change our dividend policy to only pay out the legally required minimum dividend for the next three years. For 23, the supervisory board and board of management will propose a resulting dividend payment of 11 cents per share at the upcoming annual shareholder meeting. And now I'd like to hand over to my colleagues who are in charge of running our operational businesses. And we start with Rodrigo in Crop Science. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, I'm pleased to provide more insight in the crop science performance. Overall, our crop science business has a solid year, delivering our revised guidance as previously adjusted for the glyphosate price normalization. Our core business, so everything except glyphosate, has shown robust growth of 7%, outpacing our industry peers and the broader market. This growth spans across every region and nearly every business segment. With our world-class innovation in seeds, crop protection, and digital technologies, we are delivering value to farms of all sizes, regions, and crops. Let's take corn, for example, with the Precision Smart Corn System. The breeding approach saw a successful groundbreakers program last year and is now moving on to the target commercial introduction in the US. Our biotech trade approach advanced to phase four, moving closer to an estimated launch of 2027. These are big milestones for this promising corn system solution, which is expected to fit on 220 million acres globally. In our crop protection business, the launch of Fox Supra, our newest offering for the control of Asian soybean rust, will further strengthen our number one position in soybeans in Latin America. And these are just two examples of the continuous innovation we bring to farms every year. In 2023, we launched more than 400 new hybrids and varieties, registered more than 190 new crop protection products, and introduced six new formulations. We are making big strides on our journey of scaling regenerative agriculture and tapping into new market opportunities. In India, 
we introduced our direct seed rice system and compared to the traditional rice transplant growth in flooded pad fields, directed seeded rice is sown in the ground. This system has the potential to cut both water usage and green gas emissions by more than 40%. We also saw first revenue streams from our carbon programs, foreground in the US and pro carbono in Brazil. With pro carbono commodities, we are able to make our first shipments of the Brazilian soybeans with a major track it and deforestation free carbon footprint. A great example of our efforts to protect forests and other natural vegetation. On the digital front, the Azure data management for agriculture is officially in preview, developed as part of our strategic partnership with Microsoft. The platform enables companies in the agri-food value chain to accelerate digital innovation and build new business value. Built on top of the Azure Data Manager, our Ag Power Service leverage our industry-leading expertise to provide insights on crop health, weather forecasts, crop growth tracking, and more. On the operational side, we are moving fast with the implementation of our dynamic share ownership model. With fifth of our 450 planet customer-facing squads already launched and executing changes. In summary, we deliver solid core business results and we continue to advance key technologies in our pipeline, helping us to execute our vision of producing more, restoring more, and scaling regenerative agriculture. With that, I would like to share our outlook for 2024. We expect sales to grow by minus 1% to plus 3% on a current and portfolio adjusted base with core growth of 1% to 4% and an EBITDA margin before special items in the range of 20 to 22% at constant currents. And with that, let me hand it over to Stefan for an update on the pharma business. Thank you, Rodrigo. For our pharmaceuticals division, 2023 was quite the roller coaster. We saw remarkable achievements, but also faced significant challenges. So first, let me highlight the progress we made in executing our strategy. Our cancer medicine, Nubeca, and our heart and kidney medicine, Corendia, delivered very good results in 2023. Sales of Nubeca almost doubled, mainly driven by strong uptakes in the United States and also in Europe. For Nubeca, we aim to surpass the 1 billion euros in sales this year. For our ophthalmology blockbuster product, we received approval for ILEA, you heard it from Bill, in the 8 milligram form uh, here in Europe, as well as in Japan in January 2024, which will allow us to secure our market leadership for the treatment of two specific types of eye diseases and provide patients with up to five months between injections. These positive developments will support us in driving sales momentum and support our top line. We also made considerable progress with our late stage development pipeline. For our potential blockbuster candidate, Alan Zanatan, we obtained positive top line results in two pivotal phase three studies, reinforcing the candidate's potential as a non-hormonal treatment option capable of transforming the way menopausal symptoms are treated. And we've just acquired, you heard yesterday, the marketing rights in Europe for acaramidas, an orally administered small molecule drug for the treatment of a progressive and fatal heart disease. Acaramidas met all endpoints in phase three clinical studies and is already being reviewed by the European regulators for marketing approval, hopefully with the launch of next year. As part of the ongoing transformation of our pharmaceutical division, we bolstered further our research and development capabilities and sharpened our research focus on four therapeutic areas. Those are oncology, cardiovascular and renal diseases, neurology and rare diseases, and immunology. Selected investments, as well as the successful work of our teams at Aspio, Blue Rock, and Vividian, continue to strengthen our early, mid, and late stage pipeline. We have made significant progress in the area of cell therapies and gene therapies, reaching important clinical trial milestones and advancing development programs into the next phases of clinical testing. 
From our chemo, uh, chemo proteomics platform, we successfully advanced two uh, first uh, two programs into the clinic to address unmet need in cancer patients. However, we also encountered some challenges. While the, phase, uh, while the results of a phase three study investigation uh, on asyndexion in patients with atrial fibrillation at risk for stroke did not allow for a continuation of this specific development, we will continue to investigate this important compound for secondary stroke prevention. Another challenge, and Bill has mentioned it, was the expected loss of market exclusivity for Xarelto. We felt increasing pressure from generics in several markets. This situation will continue and expand in further markets throughout 2024. In China, the ongoing volume-based procurement policy had a negative impact on our business. Furthermore, the country's anti-corruption campaign in the healthcare sector posed indirect challenges. We've seen an indirect negative effect on our businesses due to the postponement of medical events and limited access to healthcare practitioners. However, let me be very clear, with our strong compliance culture, we will ultimately benefit from a fairer and more ethical competitive environment in China over time. In 2024, we will continue to deal with some of these and other challenges. At the same time, our new dynamic shared ownership operating model will help us to become more efficient and more product and customer centric. We will therefore continue to invest in our pharmaceutical business and with that into our future. For 2024, we're forecasting sales decline of zero to 4% and an EBITDA margin before special items of 26 to 29%. Thank you for listening. And with that, I will hand over to Heiko. Stefan, it is my pleasure to give you an overview of our consumer health divisional performance for 2023 and to give you a sense of where we want to go in 2024 and beyond. In 2023, we achieved strong broad-based growth of 6.3%, amounting in just over 6 billion euros on top of a very strong prior year growth. This performance surpassed our 2023 growth gu guidance of around 5%. In addition, we recorded an EBITDA margin of 23.4%, a substantial expansion of 90 basis points versus the prior year, meeting the upper end of our full year guidance of around 23%. Achieving this amid a volatile economic and geopolitical environment is a testament to our teams, to good consumer demand resilience, and the continued appreciation and trust in our iconic brands. The standouts were our dermatology category, which saw strong 12% growth across the regions and brands driven by Bepanthen and Ganesten, and high demand for our regional brands in China, as well as the 12% growth we achieved in pain and cardio. Our allergy and cold business, as well as digestive health categories, achieved strong single-digit growth in 2023, while nutritionals were on previous year's levels. Other positive developments were the strong growth of our e-commerce business as it recorded over 20% growth and the launch of our new Precision Health unit. Looking at our results from a regional perspective, we achieved growth in three out of our four regions. North America sales were just on prior year levels. A final point of pride is how we in 2023 reached over 75 million people in underserved communities with our special access programs contrib contributing to around 20% of our total 23 growth, demonstrating that expanding access to proven healthcare solutions is not only good for our business, but it also to serve the communities. Looking now at 2024, we expect continued broad-based growth across our regions and categories at around three to 6%, with an EBITDA margin between 23 and 24, with acceleration towards these goals really kicking in post Q2. Talking of acceleration, we are uh, doing this, embarking on a bold new vision to help over 1 billion people live healthier lives with the most trusted self-care solutions. 
Achieving this will be based on an evolved game plan to grow our brands ahead of the market, generating strong de demands with our consumers and customers for our iconic, much-loved brands. A focus on innovation and launch effectiveness and the winning creative and consumer-centric capabilities of our, t of our teams. We will also seek to accelerate our operational efficiencies and our progress towards this vision by adopting new ways of working under DSO and have started working in truly cross-functional customer and category brand teams. The impact of this way of working speaks for itself and our frontrunner teams are already achieving impressive outcomes, including significantly faster times to market for innovative product and much reduced supply chain lead times. You already have heard that I'll be leaving Bayer at the end of uh, April. It is with tremendous pride that I look back on this team's many accomplishments over the past six years. How we turned around the business and built a true foundation for success. In Julio Triana, the team is getting an experienced healthcare leader with a proven track record of de delivering and a fantastic knowledge of the company and this business, having now been a member of Team Buyer for over 20 years, including time spent in consumer health. I leave knowing fully well that this division under Julio's leadership is well positioned to continue to deliver on its commitments and that it will work with passion and drive towards achieving continued success and growth in the future. Thank you very much.